So after that, let's now look at isomerism in alkynes. Exactly just the same, same way as alkenes, isomerism in alkynes is just the same. So we have branching isomerism, we have positional isomerism. So the branching isomerism, remember I say that you just... It's like you just take a functional group from another point of the of the parent branch and bring it in another point of the of the of the main hydrocarbon, and that is uh, branching isomerism. So, like for example, you see this structure is hexane. So this structure of hexane, if you remove that branch and place it in the third carbon atom, it becomes a branching isomer. So that is a branching isomerism. As simple as that. So branching isomerism, you just extract a functional group from somewhere, from the parent branch, you place it in another place of the parent branch, and it forms a branching isomerism. So isomer, remember, you say that these are compounds which have the same molecular formula, but different structural formula. Because for this hexane, if you, hexane, if you count the number of carbon atoms and hydrogen, it's exactly the same as that other one. The same, same. The number of carbon atoms and hydrogen is exactly the same. So the molecular formula is same, but the structural formula is the one which is different. So the other isomer, uh, the other type of isomerism, we saw that we have positional isomerism. So positional isomerism, you only change the position of the triple bond. So for example, if we have octane, we have octane. So we have oct one ion. Oct one ion meaning that the triple the triple bond is. Uh, is appearing immediately after carbon number one. So just remove the triple bond from carbon number one and place it in carbon number two. That is an isomer. Remove from carbon number two, place it in carbon number three. That is an isomer. That is positional isomerism. So you only need to change the position of the triple bond and you are good to go. Branching isomerism, you change the position of any functional group. Remove functional group from here, place it somewhere else, name the structure, that is isomer. Positional isomerism, you only need to change the position of the triple bond from here to there, and then you are good to go. So how are the alkynes prepared? So we looked at the different methods of preparing alkenes, alkenes. Now, how are alkynes prepared? So we can prepare alkyne in the laboratory by simply reacting water with, uh, with calcium carbide in order to get an alkyne. So if we react water with calcium carbide in the laboratory, we are going to prepare alkynes. We are going to obtain an alkyne in the laboratory. That is the simplest experiment that can ever be done in the preparation of the alkyne. So you just react to water with calcium carbide and then you are good to go. As well, this calcium carbide is collected over water method to imply that it is insoluble in water and also to imply that it is less denser than water. That's why it is collected using that method. So the sand that are found in the experiment. So the sand are used to absorb the excess heat that might be produced in the experiment or during heating in the experiment. So that is the preparation method. That is the best method which can be used to prepare, uh, which can be used to prepare the alkynes in the laboratory. So let's now go to physical properties of the alkynes, physical properties of alkynes. So first of all, like from the experiment, you can see that they are insoluble in water, meaning that they are insoluble in polar solvents, but they are soluble in polar solvents like petrol, like for example, oil, etc. Also, we can see that they are less denser than water and less denser than air. And also, apart from that, you can say that they are highly soluble. Yes, I've said that they are highly soluble in organic solvents and less soluble in the polar solvents. So they are less soluble in the polar solvents and they are more soluble in the non-polar solvents. They are also, they, they are colorless. So they are basically colorless and they have a pleasant smell when they are pure. So when they are pure, they have a pleasant smell. So they smell very nice. So apart from that, we see that they have a very low melting point as compared to water. So they have a low melting point and a boiling point as compared to water. We can also see that the density increases as the number of carbon atoms increases. So the density of, this, uh, of the alkynes increases with the number of carbon atoms. As well, you can see that the molecular mass increases as the number of carbon atoms increases. So that is that. Apart from that, you can now look at now specifically ethan ethane. So what are the properties of ethane, physical properties of ethane as a whole, if you have been asked? state at least three or four 
uh, properties, physical properties of ethane. So we can say it's exactly the same thing. So they are less dense, ethane is less denser than air. It is slightly soluble in water. It is highly soluble in polar solvents. So it is colorless. It has a pleasant smell when pure, and it has a very low melting point and boiling point. It has a molecular mass of about 26 uh, grams. It has a density of 1.09 grams ETC. So if you have been asked for, for ethane, you can just try to extrapolate from the alkynes. They will still fall under the ethane. So it should be noted that the alkynes which have a lower number of carbon, they are basically gases. So that we have the ethane, propyne, butyne. They are basically gases. So as the number of carbon atoms increases, so the viscosity, the viscosity of the alkynes increases. Just the same, same thing as we said for the alkenes. So the viscosity also increases. As the viscosity increases, the flammability decreases. The flammability of the alkynes are going to decrease. So also we see that alkynes have a very high melting point and boiling point as compared to alkenes and alkenes. So alkynes have a very high melting and boiling point as compared to alkenes and alkenes. Why is it a reason? The reason is because alkynes have a triple bond. So the triple bond requires a lot of energy to break as compared to the double bond and the single bond. So if we look at the, at the hierarchy of boiling point and melting point between these families, we can say that alkynes have the highest boiling point and melting point followed by alkenes, followed by the alkenes. So alkynes have a very high melting and boiling point because of the triple bond that they have. So now apart from that, let's look at the chemical properties of ethane as a whole. So what are the chemical properties of ethane? So let's look at combustion. Always note this, if you burn any hydrocarbon, you're going to get two main things. If you burn hydrocarbon in excess air, you're going to get two main things, carbon dioxide and water. But now for ethane, there's an exception. If you burn, if you burn ethane in limited, amount of, in limited amount of oxygen, you're going to get carbon two oxide, carbon particles, and water molecules. That is what you're going to get. So remember again, if you burn alkyne, specifically ethane, in limited amount of oxygen, then you're going to get three things carbon two oxide, carbon uh, as a whole, and then you're going to get also water molecule. But if you burn it in excess, you're going to get just the normal products for the hydrocarbons, as you can see. So you're going to get the normal products. If you burn hydrocarbons in excess oxygen, carbon dioxide and water. So if you burn ethane in excess oxygen, you're going to get carbon dioxide and water molecules. So the next chemical property, let's look at reaction with hydrogen, uh, yeah, reaction with hydrogen. So just as ethene, we said for, for alkenes, if we react them with, with hydrogen, if we react an alkyne with hydrogen, so the triple bond is going to break. And it's not going to break at once, it's going to break in phases. So if we react ethane with hydrogen, so the first thing is that the first line of triple bond is going to break in order to accommodate the hydrogen. So it's going to break and then we are going to have an ethene. So the first line will break, we'll have an ethene. Then if you continue adding hydrogen, the second line is going to break and then we're going to have an ethane gas. So remember, the triple bond does not just break immediately. So the triple bond is going to break in phases. So this breaking in phases uses a nickel catalyst in the presence of about 200 degrees Celsius. So if we react an ethane with hydrogen in the presence of nickel catalyst at 200 degrees Celsius, we are going to get ethene at first. So if we continue adding hydrogen, we are going now to get an ethane gas. So remember the catalyst to use here, we are going to use nickel catalyst. And the other thing you should remember is that the triple bond does not break instantly. It breaks in phases. The first phase it breaks, we have an ethene. Then the second phase it breaks, we have an ethane gas. So the third chemical property, let's look at reaction with halogen. So also again here, reacts with halogen. Remember halogens are group seven elements. We have from fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So when we react ethene, ethane rather, when we react ethane with, high, with halogen, so what is going to happen? The triple bond is again going to break in phases. It's not going to break instantly. So it's going to break in phases. 
So you see that this ethane, when reacted with bromine, is going to discolorize the bromine. So the bromine is going to be discolorized to a colorless solution. If we react ethane with, uh, with fumes of chlorine gas, so the fumes of chlorine gas, they are going to discolorize from being green-yellow to a colorless gas. So why is it possible? It is possible because as we started, we started by saying that alkynes are unsaturated hydrocarbons. So being unsaturated hydrocarbons, so they can easily react bromine water, potassium permanganate, potassium dichromate, and all the halogens. So they, they reduce them. So in this reaction, we see that if we react ethane with bromine water, the first thing will happen is that the brown bromine color is going to change to colorless. The second thing to say is that the triple bond is going to break in phases. So the first phase is going to break, the first bond is going to break, and then we are going to have two bonds remaining, or double bond remaining. So as this happens, we are going to have at least an ethene. So we are going to go back to bromoethene. So in this bromoethene, if you continue reacting bromoethene with, uh, if you continue reacting with the dibromoethene, because we have two, we have two bromine, the dibromoethene, if you continue to react it with, with bromine gas or other halogens, so the other double bond is going to break, and then we are going to have a single bond. So as this happens, we'll realize that we'll now have one one two two tetrabromoethene gas. So remember, we have come from ethane to dibromoethene, and then if you continue adding bromine, so we're going now to have one one, meaning that bromine is at one, at carbon number one and carbon number one. The other bromine is at carbon number two, carbon number two, as you can see. So we're going to have one one two two tetrabromoethene. Tetra meaning that bromine is ikonne. We have four bromine. One, one, two, two, tetrabromoethene. So this reaction doesn't need any special condition. It happens at room temperature, whereby this additional reaction basically takes place in two, uh, also in two phases. So the first phase, remember, the breaking of the, <coughs> of the first triple bond in order to get an ethene and then breaking of the second triple bond in order to obtain an ethane, as you can see in the diagram. So also we see that ethane can be able to react with hydrogen halide, just as, the, as we said in the ethene. So it can also be able to react with hydrogen halide. However, it is noted that hydrogen, hydrogen iodide reacts rapidly with ethane, uh, with ethane gas. So hydrogen iodide reacts rapidly followed by hydrogen bromide, then hydrogen chloride, and then hydrogen fluoride reacts very slowly with ethane gas in order to form, to form the compound. So hydrogen iodide reacts rapidly, followed by hydrogen uh, bromide, then hydrogen fluoride, and then finally, we, then hydrogen chloride, then finally hydrogen iodide, as you can see in these reactions. So how can you be able to test for alkynes? So if you have been given a sample, test for the alkyne. Tell me if this is alkyne. So how will you be able to test alkyne? It is so simple, just as the alkenes. Remember, these are unsaturated hydrocarbons. Being unsaturated hydrocarbons, they can easily produce soot and discolorize bromine water, potassium permanganate, potassium dichromate. So the first test is that they discolorize bromine water. The second test, you can say they discolorize potassium permanganate. The third experiment, you can say they discolorize potassium dichromate. The fourth experiment, you can say when heated, they produce a lot of soot. So for the alkenes, yes, they produce soot. But for the alkynes, they produce a lot of soot. So these are the tests that you can use to test for the presence of the, test for the presence of alkynes. Discolorizing bromine water, potassium permanganate, potassium dichromate, as well, you can say that they, they produce a lot of soot when burnt. And then now finally, let's look at the uses of alkynes. So what are the uses of alkynes? So the first use is manufacturing of adhesives. Adhesives, these are the glues. May, uh, yeah, the glues, these are the adhesives. So they are used in the manufacturing of the different adhesives that we have. They are used in the manufacturing of the plastics, the melamine plastics, the, the very tough plastics that you see. So these very tough plastics, they are... Uh, they are a product of alkynes. They are also used in the manufacture of synthetic fibers, like also, for example, the hairs. They are used in the manufacture of synthetic fibers, the hairs, the rayons, etc. 
They are used as grease solvents because of very high melting and boiling point. They are used in the production of chemical, different chemical reagents that are used. They are used in the manufacture of oxyacetylene, which is used in welding because the oxyacetylene produces a very, okay, the, the heat they produce is very hot. So they are used in cutting metal. So the oxyacetylene is a mixture of oxygen as well as other ethene, other chemicals, other, like for example, we have the ethane, the gases that are being used. So when these gases are, are used, they produce very strong heat. So they produce very strong heat. Now this strong heat is used in factories, in cutting metals, etc. And, it, and also alkynes are used to ripen fruits. So if you have a fruit and then you wrap it around the polythene bags, around the different polythene bags, so they are used in ripening the fruits and also an injection. So you can take a suitable alkene, you inject it to the fruit and then after some few days or after some few moments you'll realize that the fruit is ripening. What they do to the bananas. So the banana is green, then after like let's say half a day, the banana, the whole banana is yellow in color. So if you don't take that banana being yellow in color that day, if you think of storing it, by tomorrow the bananas, all the bananas will have gone bad. So it is because of the alkynes. So the alkynes are used to ripen the different fruits uh, that we see. So if you need your fruit to ripen faster, you can either wrap it or you can either inject it. So it will ripen faster. 